my name is Jacqueline O'Neill, and I am Canada's first ambassador for women, peace, and security. What is this concept of women, peace, and security, you may be asking? So the idea essentially is that better decisions get made when the people who are most close to the issue participate in making them. So when it comes to building peace in communities and building really lasting solutions to prevent violence and end wars, the best decisions to do so are made by a broad group of the community that's affected, and that includes women. So around the world, women are one of the most excluded groups from decision-making around peace and security. Right now, about 2% of the people who mediate peace agreements are women. About 5% of the people who sign them are women, and only about 8% of the people who negotiate them are women. So around the world, there has been a movement to try to get more women involved in these formal processes to end war and build peace. Uh, recognizing that women often play really, really important roles at community levels and in informal processes, but their roles aren't often acknowledged at the highest level. And that ranges from women who are making decisions about security, as well as women who are providing security in security forces like police and military. So I want to make a couple points clear about what this issue is and what this issue is not. So the concept of women, peace and security isn't about saying that women are more peaceful than men. It's about saying that men and women often have very different experiences in life. They have different priorities and that they're equally important in terms of whose priorities matter. So we need to make sure that men and women, boys and girls, all of their priorities are included in decision-making about the future of any country or any community. It's also not about exporting so-called Western values. And this is something that I talk about all the time as being really crucial to this work, this concept that so many of us are working on. So the idea came about around 25 years ago. It started to become a policy focus for the international community when women from around the world came together in Beijing and they started talking about how they had really similar experiences during war. So they were helping communities stay together. They were delivering healthcare services and caring for fighters. Some of them were fighting in the war themselves. And when it came time to end conflict, they were somehow often formally excluded from official negotiations. And this happened with women in Africa and Latin America and Asia and the Middle East and Eastern Europe and all sorts of places. And they were saying, even though our cultural contexts are very, very different, we've had very similar experiences. So they came together and they negotiated to get things, this issue on the agenda of the United Nations Security Council. So in the year 2000, the Security Council passed Resolution 1325, which was a really formative resolution. It was the first time that the global UN, its highest security focused body, decided and acknowledged that women are not only victims of conflict, which they certainly are in many, many cases, and it, which is deserving of importance and women deserve protection, but they are also powerful agents of change. So women have really important roles to play in everything that relates to ending a war and rebuilding afterwards. Also in preventing conflict. And this is something that is often kind of lost in this work is that men and women equally have really important roles to play in setting the conditions in communities so that conflict doesn't grow again. So there's been a growth in policies around this issue in the last, say, 20 years. So right now, about 81 countries in the world have what we call national action plans on women, peace, and security, or national action plans derived from this UN Security Council Resolution 1325. So Canada has one. We've had one for about, uh, we're on our second version right now. The most recent version was launched just a couple of years ago. And we have nine different parts of our government working on it. So we have departments focused on internal issues within Canada, and we also have our departments that focus on defense and focus on foreign policy. Jordan, as well, has one that they released, that you released in 2017. And it's really, really one of the most innovative national action plans in the world. And what I often talk to people about, because I was very fortunate to be in Jordan for the launch of this national action plan, was that Jordan did very interesting and important uh, model in developing its national action plan. So something that Jordanians did was bring together 
uh, groups of civil society actors, so community leaders, along with government officials, and did a number of consultations across the country to find out what were different men and women's priorities. And also did consultations very specifically with refugee communities in camps across the country to identify what are the issues that men and women are experiencing there and what are the solutions that men and women in those communities propose to address security issues. And from those identified a number of priorities. So Jordan's National Action Plan, for example, includes I think four main pillars. So increasing the participation of women in security forces, so more women in meaningful roles in the police and the military. Uh, second one is pre preventing violent extremism and protecting women from gender-based violence, including in refugee camps. One is providing support to refugees generally and dealing with the crisis in that sense. And then another one is capacity building and awareness raising among youth and civil society about the importance of women being engaged in decision making about peace and security. Canada's National Action Plan has uh, similar yet slightly different uh, priorities, but very much in the same spirit. And around the world, National Action Plans are uh, being created and are evolving to be to incorporate some of the biggest global challenges we face. For example, some national action plans now are referencing climate change and how does climate change relate to conflict? How does it relate to migration? How does it cause refugees or IDPs within countries? And how does that affect people's security? And within that, what unique roles do men and women play? I think this is a really interesting development in terms of national action plan. And again, Jordan has really been at the forefront of identifying some of these challenges and working at the national level to try to address them. So I wanted to just connect with you briefly to tell you a little bit more of the work of an ambassador for women, peace and security. And I'll end by saying we look at this issue and that my role within the government as like a surge capacity, a boost of energy on this concept of women, peace and security. So while the government of Canada has made a number of statements and has policies and people and training in place to ensure that all of the people working for the government, whenever they're focused on any issue, think about how might this affect women differently and how might women might be affected by this differently? How can we engage people in decision making related to our priorities and how we run projects, how we implement things uh, around the world? And we've been trying to ensure that there's enough energy and focus within our departments and within our government to maintain this as a Canadian priority. So I will leave it at that and wish you all the best for the rest of the month.